Now hear the word of the Lord from Daniel 8, verses 1 through 27. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south toward the east and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision... I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. 
and the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. For those of you that are new, welcome again to Sacred City Church. My name is Alex Arguello. I'm the third Alex that's been up on stage here today. Um, I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my joy to fill the pulpit this morning. Before we go any further, I do um, just want to say thank you to anybody who's sent myself or my family any sort of cards or gifts or provided meals for Pastor Appreciation Month. You guys always do a phenomenal job during Pastor Appreciation Month. I feel appreciated as one of your pastors. Feel blessed. So thank you for all of that. Why I'm in the pulpit is because Pastor Justin and the staff, along with their spouses, uh, went on a staff retreat this past week down in Mexico and enjoyed some, some good rest. Thankfully, they're back here with us safely, um, but we wanted to give Pastor Justin a break. Um, he has been preaching a lot lately, so wanted, he needs some, some rest here. Wanted to give that to him, um, and I'm thankful to be the one to do that. We are going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover. Um, those of you that are just joining us today, we love the Word of God, so this is not a 20-minute TED Talk. This is not a homily. This is preaching of God's Word. Um, Joel mentioned Martin Luther. We're celebrating the Reformation next week. Martin Luther says about preaching, it is about instruction and exhortation. So there's, there's teaching within preaching, but then there's also urging somebody to do, people to do something, which is first and foremost, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and then follow him. So that's what we want to do this morning. So if you'll pray with me, please. Father God, we, we thank you um, for just another opportunity to, to come in here and worship you corporately as the body of Christ. Lord, we need you this morning. Um, we don't want to just show up and not be changed leaving here. Um, and we also know that you tell us that you can't show up and come into your presence and not be changed. So we're thankful that we can ask this in confidence, that as we come into your presence and worship you today, as we already been singing together and hearing your word read and now hearing your word preached, and then taking the Lord's Supper, that we will be changed people leaving here, Lord. So we thank you ahead of time for that. But we do pray that you would be with us as we hear the word of God preached. You'll be with me as I speak it. Lord, I am a weak man um, in practicing this to make sure I didn't go too long. I think I've lost my voice a little bit. So be strong in my weakness and help me. Um, again, we want to honor you with what we do today. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that I uh, usually like to start with some jokes, right? Some jabs at Pastor Justin. But I'm not going to do that today, so sorry for those of you that came here to, to listen to those. Um, part of my discipleship plan is to tell less jokes up here, right? God's maturing me. He's redeeming me, so we're not going to go there today. We're going to jump right into the text. If you're just visiting with us, we have been preaching through the Old Testament book of Daniel. We've preached through the first seven chapters of Daniel, and we come to chapter 8 this morning. Chapter 8 is very similar to chapter 7. It is apocalyptic literature. We come to another vision. 
Much of this vision is easy to understand, as you just heard in the reading of God's word. An angel comes in the second half of the chapter, and he gives us some of this interpretation. But even so, commentators and scholars still disagree uh, much about what's happening in chapter 8. So what I want to do right up front here is just remind us of what Pastor Justin did last week and remember the main point of Daniel. It says, Satan rages, the king's plot in vain against him and his anointed, but Jesus wins. Jesus will overcome all opposition to him and his kingdom. He will reign forever and ever in a world without end. And if you are a Christian, you will also reign with him. I want us to keep that the focus of today. There are going to be things that might be confusing, hard to understand, unclear. But if we can remember that, that Jesus wins and God wanted to encourage his people. When Daniel was written, he wants to do the same today. I think we're going to be all right this morning. So if you will open up your Bibles to Daniel Daniel chapter 8. We are going to start in verse 1, and we're just going to go right through the chapter. Verse 1, these are the words of God. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. So this chapter opens up, letting us know that there were two years after Daniel's last vision in chapter 7. This is the third year of King Belshazzar, um, so we're still in the, 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 the Jerusalem. The Jews are still in exile in, in the Babylonian Empire. We won't get into this too much with our time, but we see that this is the third year of King Belshazzar. The number three is significant in this chapter. I want us to think rise or fall with the number three, death or resurrection. So gonna see, we're going to see that as a theme of this chapter. Daniel's doing Daniel things, having another vision. Another important point to say up front, Pastor Justin's mentioned this in the past, uh, past couple of weeks, but we are now in the Hebrew language with chapter 8. 2 through 7 was in Aramaic. We are now in the Hebrew. Don't know exactly why that's the case, but I tend to agree with commentator James Jordan. He says the focus of this chapter throughout the rest of the book is the Jewish people. So now we're writing in Hebrew. Verse 2. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ule Canal. I raised my eyes, and I saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one horn, one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So Daniel has this vision. We have a map, actually. I think it was Pastor Justin mentioned that some of us are visual learners. Wanted to give you guys some visuals today. You see the red dot on, not on this one, wrong map. But Susa is about 200 miles away from Babylon. We see see Susa mentioned in places like Nehemiah and Esther. It just seemed to be a capital of the Persian Empire. Another thing we've seen here is he also sees himself at this canal. That'll become important in verse 15. What Daniel sees, he describes as a ram, which is a male sheep, if you didn't know that. Importance of this is in this vision, unlike last week, is we're, we no longer have carnivorous beasts in this vision. We have sacrificial animals. These are animals that would be sacrificed in the offerings to the Lord by the Jewish people. Again, focusing on the perspective of the Jewish people. The ram is standing on the bank of the canal and it has two horns like most rams do. But what's special about this one is one ram or one horn is higher than the other. It also says that somehow Daniel sees in this vision that not only is it higher than the other, but it seems to come up later than the other. So what's going on here? Gretchen already read this for us, so you might have picked up on this. In verse 20, it says, As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings or kingdoms, you can think, of Medea or Persia, Media or Persia. So what Daniel sees in this vision is a symbol of the Medo-Persian kingdom that's about to overtake the Babylonian empire. We've already learned about this in chapters 2 and chapter 7. The Medo-Persians were the silver and the metal man from chapter 2. They were the bear with the three ribs in his mouth from chapter 7. What we also see here is the first um, point of this uh, rise and fall theme that I mentioned. Babylon was in power. It falls and a new kingdom is going to rise. We know from history that the Medes became independent from the Assyrians in 612 B.C., At that time, the Persians were under their control, but eventually King Cyrus rose up, defeated his grandfather, who was the king of the Medes. This gave Cyrus dominion over both the Medes and the Persians. The Persians came to dominate the Median kingdom, 
but rose up after them. Just like Daniel 8 tells us, reveals to us here. So history lining up with what the author of history said was going to happen. Verse 4. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So another map. I think that's the one that they already had. This was the Persian Empire at its largest. You can see that Medea and Persia are east of Babylon. They eventually conquered many nations to their east, as you see on the map. But what we see here in the text is that they came westward, northward, and southward. History tells us that King Cyrus first went east and took Asia Minor, then went north and took northern Mesopotamia, then went south and took southern Mesopotamia, Babylon being the capital of southern Mesopotamia. The text said that no beast, again, beast meaning kings or kingdoms here, could stand before the ram. No other nation had a chance if the Medo-Persians came to overtake them. This actually shouldn't be very surprising for God's people because if we look at the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied that this would happen a couple hundred years before it actually took place. This is Isaiah 41, verse 2. It says this about King Cyrus. Who stirred up one from the east whom victory meets at every step. That's Cyrus. He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. This was God raising up Cyrus and the Persians. Therefore, nobody could prevail against them. The text also says that they did as he pleased and became great. Other translations say he, meaning the ram, made himself great. Not because he did all the conquering on his own. We just learned that God is the one who raised him up. Rather, because all of this conquering made the Persian kings extremely vainglorious. They magnified themselves. They were arrogant, proud to the bone. Probably difficult not to be. The Persian Empire became the largest empire in the history of the Near East. Larger than the Egyptians, larger than the Assyrians, larger than the Babylonians. The empire lasted from 538 to 331 BC, over 200 years, and I'm sure that most people thought it would last forever. Similar to how many people think the United States is going to last forever, even though we've only been around for around 200 years. But as we see here, this ram is allowed to rule the world for a time and not be conquered. But we also see that Daniel's vision is just beginning. We've seen this before with King Neb. Pride leads to divine judgment. Pride comes before a fall. We'll see the same thing here. Verse 5. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Daniel's trying to figure out what in the world is going on with this ram who's conquering everybody else, and then all of a sudden he sees this goat coming from the west. The goat has this conspicuous horn between his eyes, If you're like me and needed that word Googled, it means to stand out as to be clearly visible. Not only does he have this prominent deadly horn coming from the center of his head, but he also apparently can fly. Ram wasn't flying. This is new. Let's read verses 6 and 7, and then we'll get to what this means. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him. And struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. So just as we checked on the interpretation about who the ram was, we can actually look at verse 21 to see who the goat is. It says in verse 21, And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. Justin's mentioned this man a few times previously in this series, but anybody know who the first king of Greece was? Alexander the Great, right? The real greatest of all time, the real G-O-A-T, GOAT. Did you know that's where that acronym came from? We thought Muhammad Ali or Michael Jordan, turns out it's biblical. For visual learners, this may be what these look like, right? This is an artistic, you know, taking freedom artistically, but... This would be a goat and a ram coming at each other. Verses 5 through 7 are Daniel seeing a vision of Alexander the Great 
represented by the goat with the, with the conspicuous horn and his Greek kingdom, coming to put an end to the Medo-Persian empire. Again, rise and fall. Persians rise, they get proud, and then they fall. Alexander the Great was one of the most fascinating men in the history of the world. If you've not read anything on him, I recommend this short biography that Canon Press puts out. Alexander took over the kingdom of Macedonia when he was just 20 years old after his father Philip was murdered. His father had actually taken over much of Greece in his time as king, and this made Alexander start to resent his father. He became very angry at his father because he wanted to be the one that was taking over these nations instead of his father. He grew up dreaming of being a king that would take over other nations and conquer the entire world. The Greeks had been subjugated by the Persians for many years, hence why the text says that the goat was enraged. When Alexander came to power, his heart was set on challenging King Darius III to take over the Medo-Persian Empire. History tells us that's exactly what happened. In verse 5 that I referenced, without touching the ground, this isn't speaking of him flying. It's actually speaking about the speed at which Alexander went about his conquest. Remember, I said that the Medo-Persian Empire was the largest empire to that, to, to that date. Alexander took over the whole thing in just three years. There were three significant battles between the two empires, and the Persians lost every single one of them. There's that number three again. King Darius III didn't take Alexander very seriously at first. He heard about the Greeks coming to challenge him, but he thought of Alexander as this young fool who had no chance of even making it to him, let alone taking over his army. After Alexander did make it deep into the Persian kingdom, Darius decided to assemble his army and come and meet Alexander for the first major battle. In all of his pride, though, Darius thought of this more as a victory parade or a party instead of life and death battle for the army. So he brought a lot of troops, but all of them were dressed to the nines in purple and gold. He brought musicians, he brought women, he brought children, he brought his mom, he brought his wife, he brought all of his kids. He was carried by slaves on this platform made of gold and silver. I want you to listen to this little excerpt from this book that I referenced so that you can look into this history of why the ram was defeated by the goat. This says, there were some Greek officers and counselors in the family of the court of Darius. One of them named Charidimus offended the king by the opinions in which he expressed of the uselessness of all his pomp and parade in preparing for an encounter with such an enemy as Alexander. Charidimus said, this great parade and pomp and this enormous multitude of men might be formidable for your Asiatic neighbors, but such preparation will be of little advantage against Alexander and his Greeks. Your army is resplendent with purple and gold. No one who had not seen it could conceive of its magnificence, but it will not be of any advantage against the terrible energy of the Greeks. Their minds are bent on something very different from idle show. They are intent on securing the most excellent weapons and on acquiring the discipline and the courage essential for the most efficient use of them. They will despise all your parade of purple and gold. They will not even value it as plunder. They glory in their ability to dispense with all luxuries and conveniences of life. They live on the most inferior food. At night, they sleep on the bare ground. By day, they are always on the march. They brave hunger, cold, and every type of exposure with pride and pleasure, having the greatest contempt for anything like softness and weakness of character. All this pomp and pageantry with inefficient weapons and inefficient men to wield them will be of no use against their invincible courage and energy. The best arrangement you can make of all your gold and silver and other treasures is to send it away and buy good soldiers with it, if indeed good soldiers will buy them. How did Darius respond as he condemned that guy to death? Charidimus, when that happened, he responded to Darius like this, very well, I can die, but my avenger is at hand. My advice is good, and Alexander soon will punish you for not regarding it. And that's exactly what happened. It's estimated that the Greeks came with 40 to 50,000 troops and after that battle, over 100,000 Persians lay dead on the battlefield. But many of Persians escaped, including King Darius, which means that there were far more than 100,000 Persians on the battlefield. Darius escaped, but his mother, his wife, and all of his kids did not. Why do I bring this up first? I think that it's awesome, but there was no reason, right? There was no reason why the Greeks should have taken over the Persians. The Persians far outnumbered them, and they had home field advantage. 
Yes, Alexander was this amazing military mind who had the courage and the bullheadedness to go and take on the Persians. Yes, the Greeks were fierce warriors who were bred for battles like this, even though they were outnumbered. But these are secondary causes to why the Greeks won this battle. The primary reason why the Alexander was able to take this unlikely victory is because the god of the cosmos decided it was going to happen. The Persians got proud lost, and lost to what should have been an inferior opponent. God is sovereign over the kings of men and gives victories to whom he pleases. He's sovereign over the ends, the Greeks overtaking the Persians, and he's sovereign over the means, Alexander and his Greeks being some bad mamma jammas. Just to try to make this pride before the fall theme stick, I've asked our director of media, Kurt Shainhoff, to make a quick video to show us a reenactment of this Greek victory over the Persians. The only place you play in the SEC that's not hard to play is Vanderbilt. <laughs> you, Vanderbilt you have more fans there than they have. And that's no disrespect to them. It's, not just, it's just the truth. Vanderbilt takes down. We're good. Had to do it. I had to do it. All right, let me set it down. Let me set it down. The only. So, God hasn't matured me that much. I, I'm still, still got jokes. Still got jokes. For those of you that it's an inside joke, the first part of that, Nick Saban, probably the greatest college football coach of all time, coached the Alabama football program, one of the greatest college football programs of all time. Um, he had said that the only place in the SEC not, that is not hard to play is Vanderbilt. And then Vanderbilt beats Alabama, unfortunately, and that was the, the parade after it. So not the Greeks and the Persians, but very similar. <laughs> Verse 8. Verse 8. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead, of there, instead, there came, instead, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. So after conquering Persia, Alexander continued his dominance. This is what his kingdom looked like in 327 BC. The kingdom grew larger than the Persian kingdom ever did, approximately 1.5 million square miles. But when it just seemed that Alexander was getting started with world dominance, like he had always dreamed about, Alexander died in Babylon. We don't know how he died. Many people think he was poisoned. But regardless of how he died, once again, we see the same thing that we've seen with other kings, rise and fall. God is the author of history. He gives the kingdoms of men to whom he chooses. Verse 8 shows us that God wrote Alexander's fall into history. It said, but when he was strong, the great horn, that's Alexander, was broken. Folks, that's 200 years before Alexander was even born. Secondly, God opposes the proud. The verse also says that Alexander had even greater arrogance than the Persians. He became exceedingly great, or we could see that as magnified himself exceedingly, and God judged him for it. He was only 33 years old when he died, and his two young sons were killed soon after. This left Alexander without a successor, so God ripped away his kingdom and his legacy from him. Another picture of rise and fall. And then his fall brought another rise. History tells us that four of his generals eventually split up the kingdom of Greece. These four generals became the kings of four different sections of Greece. These sections are Macedonia, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. These four generals are commonly thought to be the four conspicuous horns, horns that rose up at the end of verse 8. From there, the Greek empire moved in all four directions and became the most powerful kingdom to that point in history. Verse 9, out of one of them, that's the four horns, came a little horn, <laughs> little horn is back, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. So from one of these four kingdoms in Greece comes a little horn. Now, if you remember last week, Pastor Justin had a little horn, and he thought that it's most likely the Herod dynasty under the inspiration of the spirit of the Antichrist. So a historical person or people, but also an evil antichrist spirit that we see cyclically showing up throughout redemptive history. The little horn that we have here, we'll learn more about when we get to the latter verses in this chapter, but you'll see that I agree with Pastor Justin 
but I will also want to mention a couple other possibilities for who this could be. For now, we see that this little horn grew exceedingly great, again, magnified himself exceedingly, and went south, east, and toward the glorious land. That's most likely describing Jerusalem, the holy land, where God's people would have been at this time. Remember, Ezra and Nehemiah were sent by, back by King Cyrus to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. So that's where God's people would have been by the time this little horn rises. Verse 10. It grew great, it's the horn, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. So this horn's influence continued to spread, and it says it reached the host of heaven. So I believe this is symbolic language. This host could either be priests or Levites, or it could just be referring to God's people. I say priests or Levites because they were the servants in the temple. And as we'll see in verse 11, this horn is coming after the proper worship of God. That'll be important. The temple, the place of the worship, was meant to represent heaven to the Jewish people. So these priests were the host in the temple, therefore they're the host of heaven. The stars could also be God's faithful people. I say that because if you remember Genesis 15, God tells Abraham to number the what? Stars in the sky. Stars representing Abraham's descendants, representing God's people. So we see here that whoever this horn is, they start negatively impacting the people of God and or the worship leaders of God, which would obviously impact the proper worship of God, proper worship being important for the Jewish people. When Ezra did go back to rebuild the temple, the first thing that they did when they got there was restored proper worship. This is another death and resurrection story. While the, the Jewish people were in exile, it was a time of death or fall. When they were, um, when they were released from that and they, start, they restored proper worship, this was a time of resurrection or rise for the Jews. But by the time this little horn comes along, which more than likely is a few hundred years after rebuilding the temple, some of the hosts are thrown down to the ground and trampled, meaning God's people and or the priest would be greatly persecuted in some way during this time, bringing them back into a fall. Verse 11. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. So the wickedness continues to spread from this little horn. It gets all the way up to the prince of the host, it says here. Now, many of the commentators that you read believe that this is the high priest, which would make a lot of sense, right? Hosts were priests. The high priest would have been the chief or the, pre the prince of those priests. I think what's more important here, though, is this regular burnt offering or what's called the continual offering in Scripture. This offering was extremely important to Jewish worship. Without it, you could have no proper worship of God. Here's just a few things that we would want to know about it. Number one, an, the animal that was used was a perfect male lamb. Hence why I mentioned before that rams are male sheep, lambs are baby sheep. Number two, these lambs were offered up twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. That's why it was a continual offering. Number three, the purpose of this offering was to maintain constant connection with God through the smoke of the sacrifice rising to heaven, but also it was meant to intercede for the nations around them. This is how they, in a sense, prayed for the people around them. Number four, the significance of this offering was to express complete surrender to God, to show that they believed that God was in control of their fate as well as the fates of the nations around them. We've already been hitting on that. God is in control. He's the sovereign one. In the book of Numbers, Chapter 28, God lays out this offering as well as other significant festivals necessary for the proper worship of God. In each of the significant festivals, both rams and goats were sacrificed. So this was interesting, and one of the commentators went deep into this. This part of the vision by God using a ram and a goat is telling the Jewish people, properly worship me, and you will have benevolent rams and goats. You'll have benevolent rulers. But be unfaithful in your worship to me, and you will have malevolent rams and goats, malevolent rulers. You will be blessed or cursed by those in power over you based on how you worship. Weird. 
It's almost like what happens politically is determined by what happens culturally, and what's going on culturally is determined by what we worship. Romans chapter 12 tells us that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. So how we live shows what we worship. Connect that to being blessed or cursed for how we worship. And I wonder if how Christians have been living for the past 50 years has anything to do with the wicked things coming down from our rulers, from our civil government. In this passage, we see this most evident in the little horn that came up during the ram's reign and then continues into the next empire of Roman reign. This little horn comes and takes this continual offering away from whoever the prince of the host is and takes over his place in the sanctuary, another fall or death for the Jewish people. This is where when studying the commentaries or the scholars, you meet a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, which is the first potential addition to this complex and confusing little horn that I have. Antiochus was a Seleucid king, meaning that's the dynasty that he came from, and who ruled over that Syrian section, one of those four sections of the Greek empire. He lived in the intertestamental period and persecuted the Jews throughout his entire reign from 175 to 164 BC. Much of what we know about Antiochus comes from 1 Maccabees, which is one of the books of the Apocrypha that Roman Catholics have in their canonized Bible, We as Protestants do not think 1 Maccabees is the word of God, but that doesn't mean that we can't look at it and see what's happened in history. Many of the recorded events in Antiochus' history seem to match up very well with what's described here in Daniel 8. This man was a tyrant. During his reign, he killed the high priest Onias III in 170 BC, then went on to kill kill an estimated 100,000 Jews after that. He sacked the temple in Jerusalem and forbade under the penalty of death proper worship of God by the Jews. He forced them to adopt Greek customs and religious practices. And it's also written that in 167 BC, he erected an idol to Zeus on the altar in the temple and then defiled that same altar by sacrificing pigs to his God, an unclean animal in the Jewish religion. All of this potentially fulfills the regular burnt offering being taken away from the prince of the host and throwing down his sanctuary. He stole from the God-ordained high priest and set up other high priests. This very well could be what the vision is about. The majority of the commentators actually agree on this, but in the spirit of confusion, I think James Jordan has a compelling argument for why Antiochus cannot completely fulfill this prophecy. We will learn more about that, I think, when we get to Daniel chapter 11, but remember the principle. If God people were worshiping him properly, they would be blessed by their overlords, but if not, they would be cursed. If Antiochus is persecuting the Jews, this more than likely meant that the Jews were not being faithful in their worship. So that means that the Jews actually played a role in their own persecution. We know that before Antiochus invaded the Jews, there were unfaithful Jews who actually tried to take over the high priesthood themselves and even attack the son of the high priest Onias III. And they actually bribed Antiochus to let them become the high priest. Beyond that, after the Maccabean revolt and the death of Antiochus, the Maccabees refused to restore the high priesthood to the legitimate heir, Onias IV, and instead took it over themselves, rejecting God and his ways of worship. I think this shows us that there's more to this little horn than just Antiochus. And more than likely, it shows us that what is also included in this little horn are unfaithful Jews, the second addition to my understanding of the little horn. So we now have Antiochus, we have apostate Jews, and we have the Herod, the Herod dynasty, all filled with the Antichrist spirit. That's my clear understanding of who the little horn is. Chapter 12, or chapter 12, verse 12. And, and a host will be given over to it together with a regular burnt offering because of transgression and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Now, the ESV is a little confusing here, but what this is saying is that a host, so a priest or a Levite most likely, was put over the continual offering. That's what we just talked about. And he he was put over that continual offering because of transgression or apostasy. Because of lack of faithfulness in the worship, apostate priests were installed instead of the true priest that came from the line of Aaron. This happened under Antiochus, we know, but it also happened later under the Herods. These false priests had abandoned the right worship of God 
and chose to do what this little horn convinced them to do instead of what God had commanded them to do. We know Antiochus also destroyed copies of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, and executed anyone found in possession of the Torah, which could be what is meant here by throwing truth to the ground, God's word being the truth. Both Antiochus and the Herods were very successful in their persecution of God's people, fulfilling this acting and prospering. God used them both to curse his people, and he would continue to use this little horn to bring negative sanctions down on his people for an extended period of time. Encouraging for God's people so far, isn't it? Not really, but thankfully the vision's not over. Verse 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? So he's talking about how long is this persecution going to last? The transgression that makes desolate. So how long is there going to be apostasy? This kind of time or phase of apostasy. And the giving over the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. In the vision, Daniel hears these two spiritual beings talking with one another. One asks the other, how long will this persecution go on for God's people? And the answer is a deep hole of disagreement amongst commentators. We can't even get into how many crazy interpretations that I read about what's happening with the number 2300. The main takeaway here, though, is that the persecution in, there is persecution in Daniel's future for God's people. But most importantly, that persecution will end death, and resurrection. Many believe that this could have been fulfilled with, within a six-year period, which is around 2,300 days from 170 to 164 BC. This is when Antiochus killed Onias, or Onias III, the high priest, and then it ends with Judas Maccabeus leading a revolution against Antiochus, cleansing the temple of all the filth and rededicates the temple. This dedication of the temple started a new religious observance for the Jewish people that continues to this day known as Hanukkah, which I only know about because of Adam Sandler. I don't think this interpretation is correct, though, or at least not fully correct. It could be a type of this prophecy being fulfilled, but I think there's more to this prophecy being fulfilled. But before we get there, by God's grace, we now get some divine insight as to what in the world's happening with this vision. Verse 15 and 16. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ule Canal, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So Daniel wants to understand the vision, and he's trying to do that, most likely through prayer. He sees one with the appearance of a man might be significant. He then hears a man's voice between the banks of the canal. So there's that canal again that we seen earlier. Whoever this is, they're standing over the water of the canal. The voice then tells the angel Gabriel to do something. So Daniel again sees one like a man hovering over water who can tell Gabriel, one of God's chief messengers, what to do. Gabriel was also the angel who was sent to announce that John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah was coming. This is a pretty important angel who brings pretty important messages from God. So that makes whoever is telling him what to do even more important. I believe that this is the pre-incarnate son of God. And the significance of him standing over the water in the canal points back to Genesis and the creation narrative. There God hovered over the deep, hovered over the water, and then went on to create the world. Brought order out of that chaos. Here, Christ is standing over the water, and the vision in this water is to meant to represent pagan chaos, which God is also sovereign over. What I think we're supposed to take away from this section is that God is saying something new is coming. Something's about to change. Once again, he's bringing order out of chaos. He's going to bring new creation. So he shows up in Daniel's vision as the angel of the Lord, and here's the message that I think he's giving to Daniel and then through Daniel to the rest of God's people. These other kingdoms are going to be in power for a time. During that time, I am using them to judge you, and that judgment is going to be significant. It's going to look like I have abandoned you, and the spirit of the Antichrist has won. But take heart, my people. 
I am the one in control. I am the one who stands over the chaos and brings order. I am the one who rules over the kingdoms of men and cannot be stopped. My kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and it will never fall. I am the one who will start it and I am the one who will expand it no matter what it may look like in the moment or for the next 500 years. One day my kingdom is coming and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They will come into alignment with reality. They will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody send that to the vice president. Church, I believe that this is the gospel of the kingdom Jesus talks about in his earthly ministry shown to Daniel in a picture. Over 500 years before Jesus Christ actually came to bring that kingdom through his the ultimate death and resurrection story with him dying and him resurrecting. Christ then tells Gabriel to tell Daniel what the vision is. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So Daniel sees the angel Gabriel come in Adam and is terrified. He falls on his face. Another picture of death that we'll see continue in verse 18. Gabriel's first message to Daniel is that this vision that he has seen is for the end. This end that is referred to here isn't the end of the world. Sorry, end time prophecy nerds. This end is the end of the persecution by this little horn, who again, more than likely is Antiochus, but also continues throughout the Herod dynasty and the unfaithful Jews, even into the time Jesus walked the earth. I believe the most significant failure for the Jews was accusing and then killing the Lord Jesus Christ who had been sent to them as Messiah, the one that they were waiting for. They rejected him, rejecting proper worship, therefore they were judged. I believe this time of persecution by the little horn ended in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple as foretold by Jesus in his Olivet Discourse that we see in Matthew 24. It was God's final judgment on the apostate Jews and put a complete end to the old covenant, the first phase of the last days, and left God's people in the time of new creation. Verse 18. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And he touched me and made me stand up. Death and resurrection language again. What happens to Daniel here is a symbol of what is to happen to Israel in their future. They will be persecuted, which is a form of death, but God will one day end that persecution. He will restore them. Here, Daniel is helped by Gabriel. Gabriel means my mighty man is the mighty one. He's the angel of might. He's the angel of strength, fitting that he would be the angel sent to Daniel as Daniel becomes weak. Gabriel was strong in Daniel's weakness. As I mentioned before, where we see Gabriel again is in the Gospel of Luke when he comes to weak Israel through showing up to Mary and Joseph and announcing the coming of the Messiah, the true mighty one, the one who would forever strengthen the weak people of God by bringing them in to himself. Verse 19. He said, Behold, I will make known to you and what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Gabriel continues to speak to Daniel after resurrecting him and tells him what to expect for God's people towards the end of the indignation. This word is speaking of the indignant anger of God. Commentator Andrew Steinman says this phrase denotes furious judgment and a strong reaction to human sin. This is speaking of God's wrath towards sin, his wrath for the sin of the little horn, which would include the unfaithful Jews. Jews that reject the proper worship of God and start to worship how someone else tells them to worship. He then lays out what we've already discussed, who the ram is, who the goat are. From verses 20 to 25, the angel gives us more information about the little horn, all of it continuing to speak of the persecution of God's people and the destruction of proper worship. So we already hit on that. So I'm not going to spend much time here, but I do want us to look at the last line in verse 25. It says, without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. We see here 
that the little horn rises up against the prince of princes. So I said the prince of the host most likely was the high priest. Other people think that that is Jesus. I do not think that that was Jesus, but I do think this prince of the princes is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is probably the most convincing place that leads me to believe that the Herods and the unfaithful Jews are part of the little horn. Herod the Great was the king when Jesus was born, was born and attempted to kill Jesus by massacring all male children that were two and under showing that he tried to rise up against the prince of princes. Herod Antipa mocked Christ and then joined in the crucifixion of Christ, showing that he also rose up against the prince of princes. Herod Agrippa attacked Christ's people and killed Christ's brother James, showing that he rose up against the prince of princes. So there are numerous options for this rising up against the prince of princes, but what's more important to see here is that they would all be broken, not by human hand but rather the stone that we learned about from chapter two. The stone that would be cut out, not by human hand, and become a great mountain and fill the earth. Christ and his kingdom would come and eventually break this little horn and end his wickedness. Much of it was ended during Christ's ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, continued through the time of the apostles and the early church, and as I mentioned, was fully dealt with in 70 AD when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Verse 26, the vision of the evenings and mornings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. Daniel is then told that the vision is true, which is just confirmation that he can trust it from the angel, that it will come to pass. But then he's told, seal up the vision because it's still a long way off. Where do we hear similar language elsewhere in Scripture? The book of Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 10 tells John, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. God tells John not to seal up the vision because the things that he saw in his vision were going to happen soon. This connects Daniel and Revelation. It's showing us that what Daniel is seeing is the beginning of, of what will play out during the first phase of the last days. And what was revealed to John was the end of that first phase of the last days, which as I said, fully ended in 70 AD, ending the little horn. As the first phase ended, the second phase was ushered in and is what I believe we are currently in now, the new creation. Again, something fell, but something better rose up. We are God's new covenant people, relating to him through a new and better covenant. So that's the vision. I'm sure you all have no questions. Let's close with looking at verse 27. I love Daniel's response here. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Remember, Daniel's up there in years. He might have been 90 years old at this time. This wore him out, and apparently he caught the same bug that's been going around New City Classical Academy, apparently. And mentions that he was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. But this shouldn't be taken as an ap- in an absolute sense of not understanding it, right? The angel Gabriel was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ to make him understand it. So unless you think that God's messenger did not communicate properly, this can't mean that he didn't fully understand it. It has to mean something else. Here's what I believe this means. The people of God, whom Daniel loved and cared about deeply, were going to be heavily persecuted in the future, hundreds of years we now know. And Daniel knows that the reason that this is going to happen is because of their lack of faithfulness to God. He's appalled by this and can't understand how that could happen, after all, that God had shown and done for his people. Remember chapter 1. A contrast to this, Daniel and his friends showed faithfulness to God in their worship in a dangerous situation, setting the example for God's people. I think we can actually learn from Daniel here in verse 27. Church, much of the global visible church is a mess right now, especially here in the United States. There are plenty of apostate churches that have abandoned the gospel and the proper worship of God. There are also other churches that have become effeminate, Other churches have become woke, 
or maybe just want nothing to do with having a kingdom impact on the culture. So we may be in a place where we don't understand why it's this bad currently, and maybe we're appalled at what's going on. Based on what I was saying earlier about blessings and curses, we are in this mess because of these failures in the church, so we might even be righteously angry over what's happening. So what do we do? Before we get there, let me just try to encourage us by saying, I believe things are changing. I believe God is doing something specifically here in the United States. I don't believe he has to, right? Maybe he wants to bring down the United States like he brought down these other kingdoms in Daniel. But it seems that something is happening in the United States. More pastors seem to be preaching against the spirit of the age and getting louder. More pastors are calling their people to believe the gospel and live their faith out publicly. More men are stepping into their calling as leaders of their homes. The classical Christian education movement that desires to bring back the Western Christian paideia is growing. The Christian homeschool movement also continues to grow, increasing the number of the next generation who have a Christian education. More Christians are starting businesses. More Christians are getting into politics. To me, this is all signs that the kingdom of God is expanding. All encouraging to me. God seems to be setting up kingdom outposts around the country, and I believe that there's one right here in Bettendorf, Iowa. But more important of what seems to be happening, let's look at what Daniel shows us here. It says that he rises up and goes about the king's business. Church, regardless of what's happening in the world, regardless of what's going on in the global church, regardless of how much we don't understand why things seem to be so bad, regardless of what happens next week in the election, what's God calling us to do? Go about the king's business. Go about what Christ has commanded you to do what Christ has commanded us to do as a local church. Repent and believe the gospel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Married couples, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and then raise those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Whatever you do, do unto the Lord, not unto men. Do it all for the glory of God. Go and make disciples. Be part of churches being planted. Renew the city, build, take ground, be faithful. Live an ordinary life with a kingdom mindset and gospel intentionality. That's what the king's business is. How could Daniel do that? Why could he rise up and go to work? How could he see the trouble that was coming for God's people, be concerned about it, but still be faithful to God? He could do that because he lived by faith. The book of Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not yet seen. Daniel had seen a vision, but he didn't fully see what God was going to do. But he had faith. Church, that doesn't just mean that he trusted that he was going to be saved. That does mean that. It does mean he's going to heaven so he could be comforted. We are saved by faith in Christ. And if that is not you, please believe upon Christ for your salvation this morning. But God is not just saving our souls. He's restoring the entire world. Daniel lived by faith, therefore, he knew restoration was coming. We can believe the same. Church, be encouraged that God is in control. Jesus wins, right? He's not on the ballot next week, but he's on the throne now. I heard Doug Wilson say that that past week. I didn't, that is not me. Christ's kingdom is expanding as we speak. He wants to use us as an instrument in his hands to be part of that expansion, and that expansion is moving towards a day, a day that I believe is very far off still. We have a lot of building to do, but a day when Christ is going to come back, destroy the last enemy, which is death, death will be no more, finish restoring the rest of his kingdom. We don't sit on our hands until that happens or until we die and go to heaven. We day by day with a living faith go about the business of King Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the opportunity to come in here and worship you. Lord, as we heard today, you bring down blessings, you bring down curses. Lord, we want to be those who receive your blessings, and we know that first and foremost, we've already received the ultimate blessing. We've already received your son who came and lived the life that we could not, who came and died the death that we deserved, and then he rose up, ascended into heaven, and now he intercedes for us. Lord, so we can be comforted by that, but then he calls us to go out and make disciples and change the world. So we want to be filled up with you today so that we can then go out and be the people that you want us to be. Lord, so whatever I said, if any of it was from you, would you, would you 
put it on the, the hearts of these people, the minds and hearts of these people, and would they go, would it then transfer out into their fingers? Would they be the, your hands and feet as they go about this week? In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you.